The two cars you see here represent the polar opposites of the Hyundai i30 range. On my left is the cheapest way into the all new sedan, the Active, while on my right is one of the more costly ways into the more familiar hatch, the Endline Premium. So this will be a range review like few others, given we won't just be crossing trim levels, but body styles too. And taken together, they'll tell you everything you need to know about the entire i30 range so we can figure out which one is best for you. Now there is a lot to unpack here and you're more than welcome to stay with me for the entire video, but if there's somewhere you need to be or just a particular area you're interested in, feel free to jump ahead. We're gonna be talking about price and features, design, practicality, safety, engine specs, fuel use, ownership, and of course, what they're actually like to drive. And then I'll be telling you which one I prefer in the verdict. We're gonna pop the time codes up for you as well, so feel free to jump forwards or backwards through the review whenever you'd like to. Let's start with the i30 sedan range, which is the newest member of the i30 family and a vehicle you might be more familiar with as an Elantra. For this all new model, Hyundai has renamed its small sedan the i30, largely to simplify its range. And the story begins with the active trim, available with a six speed manual or a six speed automatic before stepping up to the auto only elite trim. Before the end of the year, they'll be joined by sportier inline models, available with a manual or seven speed DCT automatic, or the more fancy feeling inline premium, which is auto only. So what do you get for your hard earned? Well, active cars get 17 inch alloy wheels, a leather appointed interior, wireless smartphone charging, an eight inch touchscreen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, as well as a pretty comprehensive safety suite, which we'll come back to when it's time to talk about safety stuff. Jumping up to the Elite adds dual zone climate control, twin 10.25 inch screens, one in the center of the cabin, the other in front of the driver, with satellite navigation, a Bose 8 speaker stereo and DAB plus digital radio. The inline cars will add a sportier engine, a unique body kit with new look front and rear bumpers and a new mesh grille. There's also twin exhaust tips, LED headlights and tail lights and 18 inch alloy wheels. And finally, the inline premium adds a sunroof, front parking sensors, 10 way power adjustable heated and ventilated front seats and a heated steering wheel. The i30 hatch is a busier liner with a cheaper entry level model, once called the Go, but now simply called the i30, kicking off proceedings, and it's available with a six speed manual or a six speed automatic. The range then steps up to the auto only active, then steps up again to the auto only elite. Like with the sedan, you can have a sportier inline car, which can be had with a manual or a seven speed DCT automatic, or an inline premium, which is again offered with a choice of transmissions. So what do you get? Hyundai tells us the new i30 trim is essentially the old Go model with some extra safety stuff included, like smart cruise control and lane keep assist. But you can also expect 16 inch alloy wheels and LED DRLs, while inside there's an Apple CarPlay and Android Auto equipped eight inch touchscreen, a second seven inch screen in the driver's binnacle, a leather wrapped steering wheel and shift knob, an electronic parking brake, as well as the usual suspects like power windows and air conditioning. Outside of that though, the hatch trim levels largely mirror the sedan or thereabouts, though you will pay slightly more for that boot. While well, the i30 hatch and sedan are of course related, technically they're a little more like step siblings given they both ride on different platforms and both wear a very different design language. And I'm gonna start this with a little bit of an admission. Personally, I'm a hatch man. I just think in the small car segment, the compact dimensions of a hatch always look a little bit better than the elongated sedan equivalent. But anyway, the i30 sedan wears Hyundai's sensuous sportiness design language, although opinions are a little split about just how successfully it's been applied here. The front end looks sharp and shapely though with this cat clawed bonnet, the massive grille and swept back headlights, and the way it's all kind of angled down towards the road, giving it a sportier vibe. The side view is all sharp lines and angles too, but I do feel like both it and the front manage to look accomplished and a little premium. It's the rear view though that I suspect will take a little getting used to, the way the boot juts out over the edge before cutting back in and jutting out again, looking a little bit like a pyramid laying on its side. It's adventurous, yes, but I worry that it might be a touch too adventurous. But anyway, let's go check out the cabin. Now here in the entry level active, there are some reminders that you didn't splash the cash on a better equipped car. The elite levels, for example, are all lovely inside, all premium feeling materials and those twin big screens that make the cabin feel very tech savvy. Here in the active, however, you do make do without some of those niceties and it does feel a little cheaper inside. A feeling not helped by the fact that this little eight inch screen is housed in a similar surround to the much bigger screen, which means here you get a lot more flat black plastic. So with the i30 sedan, it is very much a case of you get what you pay for. 
and then there's the hatch, which in my opinion is one of the best looking cars in this segment, and especially in this inline premium, guys, which looks sleek and stylish, and without the overload of design flair so popular with new cars today. Now, it's worth pointing out that this is not the same inline as the one they get overseas. While the rest of the i30 range has been updated inside and out, we're still making do with the old inline models. The reason, says Hyundai, is the factory, with the brand only taking cars from South Korea to keep the prices down, while the new inline is only available from the Czech Republic. Still, that's not necessarily a bad thing, as I do think this car has a certain timeless elegance about it. Inside, you'll find it's an equally posh and premium feeling space with the biggest screen, the smartest tech, and the nicest cabin materials, which, should you jump into a more expensive version of the sedan, you'll find largely replicated. Still, I'm gonna give the overall design nod to the hatch. I just think it works better inside and out. You might think that the hatch is the more practical option here, and in some ways it probably is. But in terms of boot space with the rear seats in place, the sedan has it hosed. According to Hyundai, you'll find some 474 litres VDA, of luggage space with the rear seats up, compared to 395 litres in the hatch. That number swells to 1,301 litres with the rear seat folded flat in the hatch, with Hyundai yet to confirm the bigger number for the sedan. What we do know about it though is how big it is, stretching 4,650mm in length, 1,825mm in width and 1,430mm in height. That makes it longer and wider than the hatch and it rides on a longer wheelbase too. And those perks are best felt not in the front seat but in the back. Now this is a seriously spacious back seat, especially for those riding in the window seats. I'm sitting behind my own 175 centimeter driving position, and as you can see, there is miles of leg room, and there's enough headroom too. So while three adults across the back might be a stretch, you can genuinely fit two adults back here in real comfort, and there's not that many small cars you can say that about. Now the back seat is also split by a pull down divider that's home to two cup holders, there's bottle holders in each of the doors, you get your own air vents, and there's an isofix attachment point in each of the window seats. Up front there's cup holders, bottle holders in the door, wireless phone charging, twin USB ports and a power outlet. So there really is everything you need even in this base model car. Now the hatch on the other hand, despite sharing much of the same creature comforts, is a much tighter feeling space, not just in legroom but in headroom too, with the back seat feeling far more confined than it does here. The i30 sedan then is definitely the much bigger feeling car. Let's get this out of the way early. The i30 sedan has not been tested by ANCAP, but if it was, it would likely be a four-star car. And the hatch wears a five-star rating it earned back in 2017. Does that mean the sedan is less safe than the hatch? Not really. More that ANCAP's requirements are changing at light speed, and under strict 2020 regulations and without a centre airbag, it's likely the sedan variant would rate one less star than the hatch. Still, that's not to say it's underdone. You'll find six airbags along with the usual braking and traction aids before the tech steps up to active safety stuff like AEB with pedestrian and cyclist detection as well as junction detection plus lane keep assist, lane following assist and active cruise and all of that's in the active model. The Elite trim then adds blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert and rear parking sensors. It's a similar story in Hatchland 2, where even the base i30 gets forward collision avoidance assist with AEB, a driver attention warning, lane keeping assist, lane following assist, and smart cruise control. Elite and N-line models then add blind spot monitoring and rear cross traffic alert. Now, engine-wise, there are a couple of options. The first being this two-liter petrol engine, good for 117 kilowatts and 191 newton meters. Now, it's fitted to the sedan in active and elite geysers. The similar hatches get a two-liter engine too, but it's a slightly different one, and it's tuned for 120 kilowatts and 203 newton meters. But the better option and sportier option is this: the 1.6-liter turbocharged engine, good for 150 kilowatts and 265 newton meters. It's fitted to the N-line and N-line premium cars and it is a much more exciting, invigorating drive. Now in terms of fuel use, the 2 litre versions of the hatch will use 7.4 litres per 100 kilometres on the combined cycle, while upping the grunt to the end line also ups your fuel use to 7.5 litres per 100 kilometres. It's fitted with a 50 litre tank and it accepts cheaper 91 ron fuel, which means you pay less at the Bowser. Now for the sedan, it needs just 7 litres per 100 kilometres on the combined cycle. It's fitted with a 47 litre fuel tank and it too accepts cheaper 91 ron fuel. We don't know yet what the end line versions of the sedan will use in terms 
terms of fuel, but it's safe to say they won't be far off the hatch's numbers. Like the rest of the Hyundai range, the i30 family is covered by a five-year unlimited kilometre warranty with servicing required every 15,000 kilometres. Cap price servicing is available throughout too and you get roadside assistance for the first 12 months. The brand also allows you to prepay your service costs for the first five years, which will set you back around $1,400 for the two-litre cars and surprisingly less at $1,385 for the more powerful inline variants. Welcome then to the driver's seat of the Hyundai i30 sedan active powered by its 2 litre petrol engine and in this case paired with a 6 speed automatic transmission. Now let's get the good stuff out of the way first shall we. While it's no excitement machine you can't help but be impressed by Hyundai's work on the ride and handling here. Any car in which you find yourself longing for more power means it's pretty impressively sorted and that's certainly the case here. Capable around corners, comfortable on even more dodgy road surfaces it really does have good road manners for a car in this segment. Now part of that's obviously down to Hyundai's local chassis tuning here in Australia, but part of it could also be down to the fact that it rides on a new and different platform to its hatch sibling. This one's on the K3. Either way though, it does handle its dual roles of competence and comfort with aplomb. Downsides? Well, I'm just not in love with this engine. While the R30 range internationally gets all sorts of clever electrification, we get this tried and true two litre petrol engine. And if I'm honest, it's just lacking a little bit in the fizz department. Don't get me wrong, there is enough power to get it up and moving, and if you're just cruising around the suburbs, you won't really notice. But it's just that it lacks that urgency for overtaking manoeuvres or quick starts. And when you do plant your foot, it gets a little gruff and loud in the cabin without adding much in the way of out and out speed. Keep it humming along gently in the suburbs though, and it is an easy, breezy, carefree drive. While it won't deliver much in the way of excitement, it doesn't deliver much in the way of frustration either. But if you do want a more spirited, more engaging drive, you want the turbo. And since we have one here, let's take a look at that. Welcome then to the fastest and fanciest non-full-blown performance i30 there is, the i30 N-Line Premium Hatch. Now this one gets the turbocharged engine, it also gets a better gearbox, the seven-speed DCT. And in my opinion, this is the best engine and gearbox combination in the i30 range. Now I've spent plenty of time with this car over the last few months and even more so over the last few days. And I gotta say, I really, really like it. It really is a genuine warm hatch, but one that's comfortable, capable, full of technology and premium features, and it's pretty stylish to boot. The benefit of a more powerful engine too is that even when you're not using all that grunt, when you're not really planning your right foot, it just makes progress so much more effortless and as a result so much quieter that you find the cabin here is actually a far more peaceful place to be and the drive experience is a little more joyous too. Even when you're not cycling through the drive modes, and this one gets eco, normal and sport, it just feels a really well connected, really well sorted car. The steering's got a nice weight to it and it's nicely direct too. The gearbox is utterly seamless and you only need to breathe on the accelerator to allow for forward momentum. There's none of that straining of the smaller two litre engine as it struggles to get up to speed. Now the price you pay for feeling connected to the road below of course is that it can feel a little jarring or a little bumpy over really rough road imperfections but for mine that's a price I'm happy to pay and if it sounds like I'm raving a little bit about this car it's because I am. It's actually one of my favourite cars in this segment especially with this drivetrain and to me it wants for really little in the drive experience. So in the battle of turbo versus 2 litre it's really not a battle at all. For mine the turbo engine is the choice. So there you have it, the i30 range explored top to bottom from sedan to hatch and back again. Now I promised you my pick, didn't I? For mine, the i30 shines brightest in hatch form and brighter still when equipped with that turbocharged engine. And while I can't justify the full spend on the N-Line Premium, I do think the N-Line hatch is my pick of the bunch. <laughs>